Hey y'all, Dennis here, Muddy Water Search and Recovery. Megan was going to join me on this episode tonight, but she's really congested and not feeling that well. So she is getting some rest right now. Hopefully she'll get to feeling better very soon. So we're going to go ahead and jump into this. We're going to talk about the Summer Wells case. In particular, the Dr. Phil episodes that aired yesterday and today. Now, if you have not seen those episodes, please watch those. They are available uh, on YouTube as well. You can look up Dr. Phil Summerwell's case, and you'll see them popping up. And it'll actually show the episodes. But I've said in the past several times, I'm not a big fan of Dr. Phil. But... I have to admit, I think Dr. Phil done an incredible job. Uh, The experts done an incredible job. All three of them asked the right questions. They were fully involved in this. And, you know, obviously Dr. Phil's not going to watch my YouTube channel. You know, that probably just doesn't happen. But thank you, Dr. Phil, for doing what you did. And for trying to help find Summer Wells. Incredible job. So let's just jump right into this. Um, Like I said, Megan was going to join me on here. And she was going to discuss yesterday's episode with the body language experts. So I have her notes to go on. So here we go. Um, When the experts asked the parents what do you think happened to Summer? Both parents agree that they believe Summer was grabbed by somebody or abducted. Her dad thinks that Summer is dead at this point. Her mom thinks she's still alive. The reason they sat with body language experts, according to them, the family, is because they wanted to prove to their online bullies that the bullies are wrong and that they really aren't lying. The reluctance to answer questions, not only on these episodes, but just in general, period, is because of their history with law enforcement Um, Candace also makes the statement into this. She said she always feels like she's being interrogated. Um, Dr. Phil tried to bring out to her, this is not an interrogation. We are trying to help you find your daughter. And it, it didn't seem like that had an impact. But, you know, they are, they're... Five-year-old daughter is missing. So I do want to caution everybody, and we're going to get more into this as well. But I do want to caution everybody, a lot of this stuff that has been picked up on could very easily be explained by my five-year-old daughter is missing. This is why I'm stressed. That can be argued In this case, I didn't pick it up that way. I don't believe they did. But I do want to put that out there. Their five-year-old little girl is missing. They don't know where she is, according to them. So please keep that in mind as well. After they spoke with the parents, and at one point, Candace finally took the mic off, said she was done, walked away, and I'll get to that here shortly. But after they talked with the parents, they met with Dr. Phil on the stage to discuss their findings during their investigation. And one of the things that was interesting is they felt that Don, um, Summer's dad, was holding back information based off of his body language. And another interesting thing was Don said he thinks that she was kidnapped. 
the experts and Dr. Phil brought out, this is the first time that he has used the word kidnapped. Nor, usually, he has always said abducted. And the reason that they felt that was significant is the difference between a kidnapping and an abduction. An abduction means somebody has taken your kid and your kid is gone. A kidnap means it's it can be considered like a trade. It's transactional. There's going to be a ransom, something along those lines. So they did bring out that maybe Don was just using a different word for abduction when he said kidnapped, but they felt there was significance to this being the first time that the word kidnapped was actually used instead of abduction. Also, they, they asked Don if he knew what happened during the first episode, and he really didn't give an answer. He only talked about social media and feeling his need to go on social media to share what happened and share that Summer's missing, try to get help finding Summer. He felt that social media was the best avenue they could take. But during that episode, he never answered if he knew what had happened. And he was asked if he questioned Candace's, uh, her, what she said happened. Does he question her story? And he stuttered for quite a while that, yes, I've got questions, and yes, I question, but no, no, I don't have questions. I don't question. You know, he was very back and forth stuttering for, you know, a good little chunk of time trying to answer this. And the experts brought this out that he is he is doing a form of editing before trying to fully answer but in doing so he was very back and forth on that for that little time frame there and again i apologize i'm going through megan's notes with this um when asked about the vehicle that was seen in the area and I know we've reported that they are looking for a red truck uh, something that was new to us is Candace said she believes she saw a blue minivan and Don says that it was a Bronco or an SUV so those we will continue to dig into those and see how they figure in, etc. And we will update you on those as soon as we've got more information on that. And doc, they also shared a video footage of Chris McDonough. And you see Chris sometimes with Mike King on Profiling Evil. And he actually went to Tennessee and they allowed him and his camera access into the house. If you didn't see that episode, the house was very cluttered. Um, it was messy. Please keep in mind, they've got four kids. Having two kids of our own, kids make a mess. <laughs> I mean... So I'm not trying to say they're dirty people by any means. But, you know, the house was cluttered and messy. The basement door is the only door downstairs that can get you out of the house. And Summer's bedroom was downstairs. And on the video, when Chris asked her, if this door opens down here, can you hear that door open from upstairs? And Candace said, yes, absolutely, meaning anytime that door opens, if you're upstairs, you hear that door open. In the video, 
when they open the door, there is a faint squeak that you hear. And so she was saying that across that basement, up the stairs, around, from upstairs, you can plainly hear that. That was questioned by Dr. Phil and the experts after the family had left. And please keep this in mind because it does come up again. Um, Candace did refuse to let a camera crew from Dr. Phil into the upper part of the house. And the uh, both experts and Dr. Phil brought this up and it was very, very plain watching the episodes. The only thing that triggered Candace during the questioning with the experts on yesterday's episode was when they were talking about you know crime in the area crime organized crime they mentioned the cornbread mafia and this is the only time in this episode that you saw actual real emotion from Candace on the side of her mouth drooped. She starts crying. And this is where she ends up taking the mic off and leaving. Now, I do want to go back to where when she first started getting agitated and they're asking her why and Don's talking to her. And she made the comment that they're not helping me. And I took this as you're not there for you. You're there for your daughter, Summer Wells. And I don't want to get too deep into that because I don't want to push my theory onto this. But I I found that kind of interesting that You know, she makes the comment, they're not helping me. But, you know, if you haven't seen the episode, please watch the episode and let me know what you think about that part. And in fact, that, yes, because she makes another comment on Dr. Phil's today's episode. So let's go ahead and kind of jump into today's episode. Today is when they were with Dr. Phil on his stage. And today we learned that Dr. Phil and both body language experts believe that Don and Candace, neither one, done something to Summer Wells. They don't believe they killed her. They don't believe they're directly responsible for an abduction or kidnapping. So their focus come down to body language, and with the body language, their focus actually come to Candace. As her body language indicated, she was holding something back. And they flat out told her that they believe she knows more than she is saying, and she's not saying it, and this could be due to fear due to possibly even that she is hiding it inside because it is so bad or so scary that she doesn't want to think about it. Or it could even be something that she knows, but she doesn't actually know that she knows. Kind of a subconscious thing at this point. And again, if you did not watch the episodes, please watch those and you could find those on YouTube. But you, you really need to see these episodes. And here I go back into how they talked again today, how the only trigger for Candace was when they mentioned the Cornbread Mafia. This was brought out by the experts and Dr. Phil on today's episode as well. And she had very, very... Short answers, just repeating the same answer multiple times, but was very, very defensive with her answers. 
and the Cornbread Mafia, um, I'm going to share kind of a brief summary on that today, but we are working on another episode where we're going to go into a full explanation of the Cornbread Mafia. Um, the Cornbread Mafia is the name for a group of Kentucky men who created the largest marijuana production operation in the United States history. It was based in Marion, Nelson, and Washington counties in central Kentucky. The term Cornbread Mafia was first used in public by federal prosecutors in a June of 1989 press conference where they revealed that 70 men had been arrested for organizing a marijuana trafficking ring that stretched across 30 farms in 10 states, stretching from the southeast to the, to the Midwest. These states included Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, and Wisconsin, but the term Cornbread Mafia was actually coined in Kentucky in the late 1970s. And today's Cornbread Mafia, and this is something we're really going to get into on that episode, um, this is a crime syndicate that has multiple locations in several states, and they allegedly also deal in meth, other drugs, and other criminal enterprises. So we will be doing that episode very soon and trying to see if possibly they are tied to Summer's case. Um, one thing I thought was interesting, Dr. Phil brought out how in the time frame of Summer going missing, they're calling 911, police are coming out. To the time that cadaver dogs and search dogs and all of this got to the area, that he says <clears throat> there is no way that the family would have had time to have killed Summer and buried her anywhere around there because the cadaver dogs and the other scent tracking dogs would have went right to her. Um, with that timeline... I would I would agree with that on that timeline, but there is no proof that that timeline is actually correct. So I still think there is that possibility. Another thing that I that we learned through these episodes is initial reports state that uh, her and her mother was outside planting flowers in a garden. And she had taken Summer in the house, then come back out to help finish up. Well, on this episode, we learned that she did not come back from the house to help plant the flower bed. As she come out to help her mom uh, put on her knee brace. So there was some inconsistency with initial reports that they were planting flowers to now. She was helping her mom with her knee brace, but that's, I don't know if there's significance there. We will continue working on this to see if there is, and I want to invite you guys, please comment to me, text me, uh, email me, etc. Let me know your thoughts on this case. Let me know where you stand what way you're leaning on this, any theories you have, you know, share, share those thoughts with me. I'd, I'd really appreciate that. And I'd like to hear what, what all of you have to say on this. And that also actually helps us where we could take any thoughts that you have on it, put with what we're finding and see what fits and what doesn't and what area this goes down but we will continue digging in on this case getting all the information we can we will keep you updated as this continues to progress you know our thoughts and prayers are with summer the family the family they spoke about the three boys being taken out of the house 
we found out that Don originally thought it was a good thing because of all of the threats and everything that the family was receiving. He felt they were safer not at the house. Um, he said that Candace did get mad at him over that because she didn't want them leaving the house. Um, I can't say what I would think in that situation either way because I'm not in that situation and I don't want to I don't want to sit here and theorize well I would do this because honestly I don't know but there was at this point they said that with the threats and stuff that's died down they feel that through that it is safe for the boys to come back there was a few things that Child Protective Services wanted done first. Um, they did want it to be more clean, less cluttered. Um, they want them to build a wall in there in some particular place. And Don did confirm that this is stuff that can be done fairly quick. And... I do have to say that if the only thing keeping me from having my kids was I needed to get rid of some of the clutter and build a wall, that would be done so my kids would be home. Um, Don said he does want his boys back home. Candace wants them back home. And so our thoughts and prayers go out to the three brothers. Um whether they're involved in this or not, my thoughts do go out to Candace's mom and dad. My thoughts and prayers go to them. At the end of the day, this is a five-year-old little girl. With this, we will continue to dig in. We will continue to keep you updated. With that, until next time, you guys stay safe. And let's keep working to find answers on the Summerwells case.